Paul and Eleonora Fulani are also running for the presidency of the United States. You may not know their names, but both candidates are on the ballot in virtually all 50 states. I'm Bob Ray Sanders. Tonight you'll have an opportunity to meet Lenora Fulani of the New Alliance Party and Ron Paul of the Libertarian Party and hear their views on the issues. These candidates have received little national coverage and we thought public television viewers might want to know a little bit about them. First, Lenora Fulani. Assalamu alaikum to my Muslim sisters and brothers. Lenora Fulani is the first Afro-American woman running for president whose name will appear on the ballot in all 50 states. Fulani's message of economic opportunity for minorities, housing for the homeless, and national health care has been heard mostly on local radio talk shows and in public appearances throughout the country. Fulani's aim, short of winning the White House, is to send a strong message to the nation's minorities that the Democratic Party no longer represents them and her new alliance is their only hope. Dr. Fulani is 38. She's a psychologist in New York City. She has degrees from Hofstra University, Columbia University Teachers College, and her PhD is from City University of New York. Dr. Fulani, thank you for joining us. Thank You've you. said that your main objective is to dump the Duke, that Michael Dukakis that is. Now, considering uh, that you may not win this election, isn't it more likely that your constituents would be better served by a Democrat than a Republican? Absolutely not. We'd be, we'd be much better served if, in fact, we come out of November 8th with some political power, which is what my campaign is all about. It's a fight for more democracy in this country. It's an attempt to um, make it very, very clear to the powers that be that the black agenda, my people's fight for social and economic justice, will be expressed and continued. And what I'm attempting to do on November 8th is to both both build a national third party and to defeat the Democratic Party as a way to teach them the problems with taking the black vote, the progressive vote, for granted. So you're not saying that George Bush is better than Dukakis or that the, he doesn't really differ on issues than Dukakis? Well, like um, most Americans in poll after poll over the last couple of weeks, I think that they're both uh, unacceptable. I think that they're totally unappealing. I think both their parties are parties of white corporate America. What I'm interested in doing is giving the American people a real option and because I'm on the ballot in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, I'm the first black woman to have qualified for federal matching funds, this campaign has managed to intersect a sentiment in the country, in the African American community, among gays and lesbians, Native Americans, progressive people in this nation that's crying out for a new day in politics. We're sick of rich white men running this nation. And yet Jesse Jackson, uh, and it seems that your campaign you know, took on a, a sort of a new thrust after he was not nominated and, of course, not selected for, for vice president. Uh, had he been successful in either one, had he been chosen as vice president, would you have considered that the system worked and your candidacy would not be necessary? Well, I began my campaign with a slogan, two roads are better than one. I supported Reverend Jackson in the Democratic primary. If he had run won, I would have stopped running and gone with him, fought with him on his way to the White House if he had gotten the nomination as presidential candidate. Of course, you never expected that. Uh, no, I was sure, certain, as many people were, that the Democratic Party was much more likely to choose the rich white men that they did choose. This campaign, by the way, has gotten tremendous support among the African American community, which is not sold on the Dukakis Benson ticket. In fact, we're outraged at the mistreatment of Reverend Jackson out and our agenda. Independent black leaders like Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam, Reverend Al Sharpton, who's a staunch supporter of Tawana Brawley, a sister that I am supporting and speaking out on behalf of, uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Temp in Dallas, Diane Ragsdale and Al Lipscomb, who's on the City Council, and State Senator Ernie Chambers have embraced as their campaign. They're supporting it because they see it as uh, one possible way to continue our fight for a black agenda in this country. And yet Jesse Jackson is staunchly supporting, or at least he says publicly that he is staunchly supporting the Democrat Democratic ticket, uh, or has he told you secretly that he's really hoping that you're successful in helping to dump the Duke? No, basically, I think Jesse made it clear to us 18 months ago that he was going to run as a loyal Democrat. The only point that I'm making is that though his campaign was brilliant, Jesse did a wonderful job. Now I'm in supporting Michael Dukakis and the Democratic Party. He's supporting their agenda, not the black agenda, not even the agenda of the rainbow movement. At this point, we can support the candidate who 
who's going to be on the ballot in November 8th, who represents and stands for Jesse's social vision, and you better believe it's not Michael Dukakis or George Bush. Now, now you brought up the name Louis Farrakhan, and, and we started with a little clip of you saying, Assalamu alaikum, which is a rather non-threatening phrase, which means peace be unto you. But yet, uh, that association with Farrakhan, th that's an extremist person in the eyes of many Americans, and you, you don't see any problem with his support. Well, see, I think in the eyes of many Americans, because of the tremendous racism in this country and the stereotyping and the attacks by white corporate America, being associated with the African-American community is extreme. <laughs> One of the things that many black folks are up in arms about relative to our leadership is that they need to come back home and they need to get more involved in our struggles. I support Minister Farrakhan as a leader in the African-American community. What we share is a tremendous love for black folks. And to tell you the truth, I think the powers that be, again, the rich white men that control almost every facet of our lives in here in this country, don't quite know what to make of black leaders who stand up in behalf of the African-American community and speak out in opposition to the trials and tribulations there. I, I think with Minister Farrakhan, it's perhaps not so much his support of black people, but his, what is regarded as anti-Semitic statements against Jews. I mean, when, when he says that black people will no longer be controlled by Jews, uh, do, you don't, do you agree with those kinds of statements when he makes those statements? Well, Jews are, you know, you know, knew their wickedness. Uh, one of the things that I've been um, very clear about teaching people, both white folks and Jewish people, is number one, a lot of the African American community responds to the singling out of Minister Farrakhan in the way that he's been singled out as an attempt by white America to tell us who our leadership is. And what black folks have made clear, I mean, after all, tens of thousands of black people turn up whenever Minister Farrakhan appears. These are people who are not Muslims. They're people who come from a wide variety of backgrounds. Grounds. But we've seen, as we're seeing in his case, as we see in the case of Reverend Al Sharpton, as we see in the uh, misconstrued statements about Tuana Brawley, an attempt, I believe, to alienate our leaders, especially those who have the guts to speak out. Let me just say one more thing. I was just going to say, a lot of black people don't, don't go along with Reverend Sharpton and the Tawana Brawley. Uh, story. Uh, those are probably some of the ones who work for the New York Times. It's kind of hard to get your paycheck from the Times and the Democratic Party and support what's righteous in the black community. But let me tell you what the people of this country need to stop supporting. One of the things that the Democrats and Republicans have been expressing, and my campaign has highlighted this, is a tremendous abuse of power. I qualified as an African American woman, as a citizen of this country, to be in the debates, and they denied my right to do that. At this very moment, there is a court case in the state of of Indiana. I'm the only presidential candidate on that ballot legally. The Dems and Republicans have been placed there because they even though they filed late and they have no right to be on the ballot there. That's an abuse of power. That's an attack on democracy. That's something that black people, white people, Jews, Native Americans, gays and straights, everybody should be speaking out in opposition to. Okay, and just how bad would a Republican have to be? Would you support uh, or be doing the same thing if uh, Reverend Robinson was running as a candidate? Well, I guess the point is, is yes that no, we've had 200 years of wealthy yeah. white men I'm ruling sorry. our nation. We're out of time. I don't like either of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll talk with Libertarian candidate Ron Paul. As quickly as possible, we'd want to get rid of the income tax. We'd want to get rid of the Federal Reserve System. We'd want Getting big government off the back of the little guy is the message Ron Paul preaches to students at colleges and high schools across the country. A former four-term congressman from Houston, Texas, Paul quit the Republican Party last year to run for president on the Libertarian ticket. While Paul is on the ballot in 46 states, he has few illusions about his chances of winning. Rather, he believes his campaign is laying the groundwork for future libertarians. Dr. Paul is 53 years old, he is a practicing physician, lives in Lake Jackson, Texas, and holds a bachelor's degree from Gettysburg's College and his MD from Duke. Dr. Paul, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, let's get right to the point. Now, you want to get rid of big government. Uh, you want to reduce the government in our lives. And you also want to cut out the income tax. Now, I know a lot of people against the income tax, but I don't think anybody that I know believes that you can really have a government this strong and pay for things here without that tax. Oh, no, you can't. You can't have a government like this without an income tax, but we don't want a government like this. This is not the kind of government that was designed by our founders of the country. It's not what was written in the Constitution. We've only had 
had an income tax since 1913, but if you want a welfare state, and if you want to police the world and pay for the defense of Japan and Germany, send foreign aid to the Soviet Union, you not only need the income tax, you need the Federal Reserve to print up the money when the deficit uh, is accumulated. So we think the government should be much smaller. If the government is small, then you don't need an income tax. The income tax only covers 38% of next year's budget. Well, I mean, but you're also talking about eliminating the FBI, the CIA, some parts of uh, national health care. Uh, I mean, how, how do you do that? I mean, uh, do you just ride into town one day and say, okay, everybody leave uh, who works for these agencies? Well, you, the president doesn't do it. Obviously, we have to, that's why we talk to a lot of young people, because they're the ones who are paying these bills. They're the ones who are inheriting this debt. So it's most likely the young people who will move into this uh, next generation uh, in, in government will say, look, we can't afford it. We're broke. We better do something else. Now, you can't do it with waving a magic wand, but we have a growing number of people in this country are starting to realize that even if they might not agree with us on our moral principles and the Constitution, they might agree that economic law says we can't afford it any longer. I mean, we're running up $240 billion deficits per year. That's how fast the national debt is increasing. So the young people, there aren't enough young people to pay for this type of government. So the type of government we have today is coming to an end. Okay, let me be clear now. Regardless of what you keep in terms of government and regardless of how small, it still has to be paid for. How would it be paid for? Well, the income tax only covers 38% of next year's budget. Oh, okay. So maybe you'd have a national sales tax. Maybe the states would raise the revenues. Maybe we would have so much tax per individual. Maybe there would be an import tax. There would be something other than the personal income tax. The personal income tax is the worst type of tax. Okay. Now, now you're, you're a doctor. You've taken the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, from what I understand you believe, though, about health care, uh, you're going to leave out a lot of people, poor people, uh, if we put your plan into action. How do I mean, you who, know? who really need health care? How do you know? That's a bad assumption as far as I'm concerned. There are 38 million people today that have no health care after the government's been in health care for 45 years. If you want to look at health care when government really controls it, go to the Indian reservations. Worst care in the world. Go to the VA hospitals. We spend a lot of money on health care, the government today. The price has gone up, the quality has gone down, the distribution has been eliminated. There are more people without health care now since the government's been in the business. Okay, but how you, what do you do to, to get better health care? It's sort of like asking, how do you deliver bread to poor people? How do they get bread? They work and they go out and get it. Services and goods in a free society are delivered by the marketplace, but not by government. Now, if you think government is supposed to deliver all goods and services, you have to join uh, a philosophy called welfareism or socialism, and we, of course, reject it for moral reasons, for humanitarian reasons. We believe the best distribution, the highest standard of delivery is done under a free market system. Yeah, but there are some people who, who, who can't. Uh, do for themselves. I mean, we got people out on the streets right now in this town. Maybe thirty thousand of them. What, what, what? That's right. They're all they're all a result of government. Government inflation, government deficits, government programs. So but, if you but, really but doesn't government have them, a responsibility to come and take care of them? Personally, now? we do. Yes, but I don't have the right to steal from you because somebody out in the street needs your help. You have an obligation personally to help them. But I don't have the right to interfere with your right to take something from you and deliver it to somebody out on the street. And you have to remember. There are more people on the street today without homes, without medical care since we've been in the business of welfare. So if we want to eliminate most of the people who are in need, you have a free market system. But the question is still legitimate because there will still be some people who will have need. Our answer to that is it has to be taken care of through voluntary means, never through coercion, never through force. You, you said we shouldn't be nearly as involved as we are in foreign affairs and, and support, defense support, military for our, our allies. I mean, let me throw this. What if Mexico all of a sudden had unrest down there? We thought they were going to go communist. What, should, what would you do in your administration? Well, the first thing I'd stop doing is sending them money. You know, they're broke. We just sent them this week $3.5 billion to bail out a government-owned oil company, which props up a socialist system. So I would say that's not prop them up. As we have bank failures here and the oil companies here in de destitution, we continue to finance them. So I would say totally ignore them. If there's a threat to our national security, you never act secretly through the CIA or doing anything militarily without the consent of Congress. But Congress is responsible to defend this country. But, but what, if, what if the so 
Soviets started sending the money if we didn't send the money. And, and then the Soviet system would fall even more rapidly. They can't even feed themselves. We're financing the Soviet system, and too. You wouldn't worry about that as president of the United States. Well, I would worry if they threatened my security and the security of the country. But I think it would be helpful to bankrupt the Soviet Union if they want to spend all their money because they couldn't win in Afghanistan and they're broke and now they're getting more loans from the Soviet but they could from the put United up a, States. They could put up a missile base over there across well, the border. Well, they have one in, uh, in I'm, Cuba. I'm talking about in Mexico across yeah, the border. Yeah, but they have one in Cuba 90 miles off our shore. And ever since Kennedy, all our presidents have agreed never to touch Castro. At the same time, they tell us we have to spend $300 billion a year stopping the spread of communism. So I would say that supporting and making sure Castro can exist is ignoring some hard, cold reality. I've got a quick laundry list here. Uh, try to answer th these in, in just one sentence. Tell me what you would do in, in this case. Public schools, what should we do? Well, I think we should give it some competition. I think we should immediately introduce competition through the voucher system or through tax credit so that we don't have a monopoly control of the public schools. Social security. The po social security, the people should know the truth, that it's bankrupt and that young people won't get anything and that therefore we should start to privatize it. Death penalty. Death penalty, I would support the death penalty. What about Star Wars, SDI? I think it's worth doing research on, on uh, uh, SDI, but I would take the money out of the money we spend overseas. 70% of our military money is spent overseas, subsidizing rich allies. It should be spent on the defense of this country, such as SDI. Well, let me just ask you, do you know any place now or in the past where the libertarian rule has worked, for, I mean, where the liber liber libertarian principles have been employed and, and worked? Well, I would say that the the uh, most, uh, most libertarian society probably was in the United States, and we've had the greatest prosperity uh, than any country in the world. In the last 70 years, of course, we rejected libertarian views. Hong Kong, I I'll think, is a pretty good example of what happens you off, when you have a free market system. We're out of time. Thanks a lot. And thanks to you for joining us to hear two of the other voices which seek to be heard in this important election year. Good night. Be sure you're tuned in for Campaign 88, The Illinois Issues, Wednesday night at 8, right here on 12. A World of Ideas with Bill Moyers is next.